Hello and welcome. My name is Adam Barnard, and on behalf of GateWorld.net, I'm sitting down with actress Ellie Gall, who played Catherine Langford in Stargate Origins. Ellie, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Adam. Today's pretty wild because at the time we're recording this, the feature cut just came out. And I mean, I went to iTunes yesterday and on the front page in the new and noteworthy right next to all like, the studio releases, mm -hmm. I see Stargate Origins. So how is it now that this project has a new life? Is that, that must be really exciting for you to get to see that come out in kind of two different formats. It is really, really exciting. Yeah, it's really cool that now people who maybe didn't have access to Stargate Command can now yeah. go and see it. All my friends that didn't finish watching it can now watch the feature cut and actually right. sit down from start to finish. Um, I actually haven't watched it yet. Um, so that will be really cool to see kind of my work from start to finish. I haven't, I haven't gone and watched all the, the episodes back to back since they've come out. So I, I'm a, I watched them as everyone else probably did. Absolutely. And like the, the two formats are very different and interesting in their own right, because with the web format and the web series or the, the digital episodes, you have digestibility, you know, you can kind of jump mm -hmm. in and jump out of the narrative with the feature cut. When you watch it all the way through, like it has the new title sequence, it just feels mm -hmm. epic. And, oh, does it? Yeah. Yeah. It has that was oh. one of the additions. It's super cool. Oh, cool. So it has kind of like, this this real engaging kind of full sense of adventure where the last one you were kind of digesting it in chapters, kind of like you said. Yes, definitely. So in terms of your uh, career, you've been acting for quite some time. And I believe you actually weren't, you acted uh, in your home country before you came to the US. Can you tell us a bit about how you grew up and how you got into the industry and, and realized you wanted to be an actress? Um, I think I always knew that I wanted to do it. I can't specifically pinpoint one thing that was like, yes, I think just going to the movies, not going a lot as a kid and it being something very spectacular and inspiring and, you know, really getting my imagination going and seeing something that seemed really far away and, um, unobtainable and glamorous, I guess I wanted to do it. And, um, I was very stubborn as a kid. I was probably a lot like Catherine was <laughs> as a kid. I, I knew what I wanted and I wasn't always sure how to get it, but I sh was sure that I would get it. Right. So, um, it, yeah, I started off in a small agency doing some catalog modeling, auditioning for commercials, booking some commercials and then starting acting classes. My, all my, my training started on camera. Um, so I think that that probably helped me mostly as a as a young kid booking things um so yeah when I was 15 I, I finally booked my first kind of role on a tv show called Puberty Blues which is a really really amazing show if anyone has the time to watch it they should definitely watch it um yeah it's about the 70s in Australia and the surf culture in Australia and about two young girls who kind of want to be part of the popular group and the misogynistic culture in Australia at that time. And it's a really, really beautifully well-made show. Working on that because it was such a recognized show then led to me getting, what did I do after that? I did, um, I did a Disney show a little di for Australian Disney. Um, it was almost like a web series actually it was uploaded onto YouTube. Um, and then it would be played in between shows on Disney in Australia. So does Australia have like a pretty rich um, TV market for original content? Because it seems like, um, I guess like a, a lot of times Americans don't think, you know, we, we kind of focus on most of the shows that are like shot in here in England and that's it. Yes. Um, but there yes. are like productions and actual TV shows that are kind of tapping into certain countries' culture. Like, so did you kind of experience that and you kind of found a niche in like Australian TV? Um, not really, to be honest, because the industry is very small and I, I had success in Australia and my success wasn't that big, but for me getting to, I ended up landing a guest role in a place to call home, which was a very, very well respected show at the time, um, with really, really great established actors in Australia. Um, but even, you know, it, it's a very small industry and you see a lot of the same faces all the time. Right. in the same shows and um 
for me, it gets very boring to watch the same people do the same kind of things. And they're not making TV for young people as much as they are here because network television in Australia is watched by older people like right. my parents. So <laughs> you, I, I mean, there are some really good shows. Um, Please Like Me. That's a really great show. Um, what else is some good ones to come out? Didn't Margot Robbie get her start in Australian TV? She did in Neighbours. So most people will that, which is a soap opera, funnily enough. Um, so there's Neighbours and then there's Home and Away. I did one episode of Home and Away, which is kind of like your golden ticket to, oh, okay, when you go to America, they'll look at that and go, oh, cool, you've done Home and Away or Neighbours, you're good to go. So when did you make the jump from uh, Australia to the United States, and and how? What was the catalyst for that? I moved. I moved just over a year ago now. Um, so basically, I w- had a manager. I'd had a manager for maybe three or four years. I'd been self-taping in Australia, so sending my auditions over, filming there. I booked a pilot um, at the end of 2016 um, in Australia that shot in Canada, and then I ended up booking Ash vs. Evil Dead at the beginning of 2017. Ooh, that's awesome. It's a great show. Yeah. Oh, it's a really good show. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. So we filmed that at the beginning of last year. And um, then w- once the pilot didn't get picked up, my manager and I um, decided we'd apply for my visa. And then once my visa got approved, I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to America and uh, do it over here because it seemed like I was having more success with roles here than I was that was going to be offered to me in Australia. It felt like it was time to commit to being an actor and really immersing yourself in it here because in Australia, I mean, for me, I was living close to the beach and everyone kind of does their own thing and not everyone that you surround yourself with is a creative or understands the industry. And Certainly, yeah. Here in LA, it's just, I don't know, everyone, if they're not in it, they kind of understand it. And there's a level of artistry here that isn't, for me, I didn't find in Australia or like communities and that kind of understand what you're doing. And it's really cool to be here in LA and I'm really, really loving it. Right. So if you came here, you said about a year ago, that was mm-hmm. like right before you got cast in, in Stargate Origins. Like you got cast within months of, of first arriving. Um, I, so I was here, I had moved, I officially moved end of May. Um, and I got cast in Stargate October. I think it was early October. Yeah. Early October. Um, so I was here. It felt like a long time before I booked Stargate. Um, (laughs) yeah, it was probably, how many months is that? Oh my gosh. Uh, I think it's five, May to October. It's five, I think. Yeah. yeah. Cause the, the, the deadline article that came out was October. So if it was around then, yeah. Yes. It was all very, yeah, very, very quick. So did you go in uh, for like a, any chemistry read or did you just self-tape and go straight to offer? How did how did the your casting process come about and how many rounds did you have to do to get the role? I actually, I self-taped and they offered it to me. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. My manager had sent them. They were familiar with my work and they had seen other material of mine. Um, so... Yeah, they were basing that off other things. But yeah, it was very quick that we started shooting within a week of me being offered the role. Um, And once you get offered a role, then there's the whole, you have to work out your contract and wait until the contracts, you know, because sometimes you get offered a role and if you haven't already signed a contract, because sometimes when you test for a role, you'll already do all your paperwork so that once they offer it to you, it's yours. But um, yeah, it, it it wasn't actually mine until Tuesday, and then I went into rehearsals on the Wednesday, and then Thursday and Friday we had I think we had another rehearsal, and then shooting Saturday. It felt very very quick. It was like oh okay I'm a I'm a working actress in LA now. This is really fun. Right, so it's a lot a lot of waiting, and then full throttle. Yeah, I think also I've gotten very used to the not waiting. So I think a lot of actors in LA, especially people who were work you know don't have other jobs to support themselves wait a bit too much or but there's always something I'm learning now is there is always things that you can be doing as an actor there's always ways that you can be working um but not you know some on things that people aren't paying you for but 
this is a craft and there's always work to be done and um, finding the joy and the fun in that is is something that I'm really working on at the moment. Yeah, and I think that's good wisdom for any facet of like the show business because like one thing I see with a lot of young artists, like I went to film school and I've been in that community a lot. Is oh, cool. yeah, yeah, I went to Chapman, which is actually where a lot of the crew. Oh yes, yeah, yes, Nico. The- that was uh, yeah, Nico, DOP, yeah, Rachel, the um, script supervisor. Yeah, I was in classes yeah. with them just like two or three oh, years cool. ago. It's weird. Um, that is weird. Wow. But yeah, with a lot of like artists who have have dreams of of the more exclusive roles, like you know, musician or actor, they mm-hmm. they'll work really hard, and then once they get into a place where they start to get some visibility, they kind of like sit back and wait for their big break. You know, it's like I'll oh, wait till yeah. I get an agent, or I'll wait till I get a better manager, or wait till yeah. I get this role, and it's like you still have to go out and and um, practice, even if no one's watching. Yes. No, you really, you really, really do, and I think that's why a lot of actors get disheartened here in LA or just in any stage of their career because they're always waiting for someone to validate their talent or like say that they can do work. There's always work that people can do on themselves and for themselves for their instrument really, which is essentially what it is. Um, Yeah. So when it comes to the character of Catherine Langford, you are the sixth actress to be portraying uh, this character. So you know, when I was preparing for the interview, I was thinking, like, it's not like a situation, like, say, with Han Solo in the Solo movie, where, like, there's this mm-hmm. iconic character, and mm-hmm. it's Harrison Ford. It's just always been known yes. as Harrison Ford, and then yes. Alden Ehrenreich has to come in and kind of figure out how to, you know, blend interpretations. With you, mm-hmm. it's like there's five other actresses. It's not like you can single in on one performance yeah, on and say, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to try to match this. So how did you go about crafting the character of Catherine, your iteration of Catherine, and kind of inform those specific performance choices? Um, I think for me, it was really just about knowing her history, knowing her relationship with her father and her situation that she was in in Egypt and what she wanted. And I I think working, I learn a lot working in this medium, um, in this genre that you have to really you have to be so present, but you also have to know everything that's going on and you have to see everything that isn't there because so much of it is imagined. And if you're not clear or specific or um, if you don't understand what's going on, then the audience probably won't understand what's going on. But I think as well, we're lucky that we worked on something that is so established and the fans are so loyal and they're so passionate and that they are so invested in the world that they see things that you know, they, they're going to see that imagery just as clearly as we probably will. Certainly. Um, so with, and with Catherine, like your character is very much the protagonist and, and, and not a passive protagonist, someone who mm-mm. makes decisions to continue the story and, and makes very risky decisions or very bold yeah. decisions um, yeah. that, that many other characters would shy away from and many others like Beale or Wasif or others are a yeah. little cautious about. How did you kind of bring her straightforwardness to life? And like, did you reference any other kind of performances or characters or what do you see as her, her core values and traits? Um, I didn't reference any other characters or any, I didn't reference any other Catherine performances Same. because I, I didn't want it to feel mimicked or copied or, and also given the time frame that we had, I don't think that it would have been the best use of my time to come home and, <laughs> you know, right. try to copy down the, all the features and whatever. Um, so she's very strong willed and for her, it's all about her father and she acts very fearlessly, which is very careless because there's a, what is it? There's a difference between fear and, um, bravery, right? Like to be fearless and to be brave are very different things because to be brave, um, for me anyway, it is as if you've thought through, what you're going to do and you know the risks and then you go and do it anyway. Whereas Catherine, she doesn't want to think of the risks because that's going to be a setback. She'll just do it. And the fact that the boys, you know, as reasonable as they are, they hold her back. And it's a fun little dynamic to play with. And it's really fun to 
really command two men does and of the time as well <laughs> yeah in the 1930s which is a very different era in terms of gender very, roles yeah yes yes and i mean now you'd have a character like that in this context in this day and age it wouldn't be a thing it wouldn't be so shocking but then for her to be like that because she has grown up around a lot of men and she's always she's never been fully treated like a woman would be at her, in her time. She has always been respected. And so with that, she has, she backs herself and she has authority when she say, says things. And yeah, it was, that was cool to, to play. That was really cool to play. Right. Absolutely. And like, I know with like characters like Beale, they're so proper and British, like it probably mm -hmm. at the time, like, you know, I'm not saying this is right. I'm just saying it for historical context. Like they wouldn't want to be bossed around by a woman. No. And that's why his character is so fun and, and interesting because he lets her do that. He is open to me telling him what to do for Catherine, telling him what to do. And if anyone kind of understands the historical context, they'll know that that's like a, he really, really cares about her to let her do that to him. And what he's doing is incredibly brave and yeah. scary. And that's why, for me, that's why I think the dynamic works so well, because Siobhan, who plays Wasif, just is completely blown away by how blindlessly he's following me. Right, yeah, and it, it's kind of like a, a row of characters, like you go, so then Beale goes, and then Wasif goes as a result. You're kind of yeah. dragging all these people along with you. Uh, how was that dynamic with uh, Captain Beale or with Philip Alexander? Did you get to kind of add some of your own interpretation of kind of the romance or the conflict between their two like, kind of cultural positions and what they're used to, or was that something that was really in the script? Um, it was really in the script, um, but Philip's really amazing. He's a really talented actor, and he brought so much to it. He really, really knew. He was very specific about the accent. He was very specific about this person's body um, and the way that they moved. And so for me, it, I, you know, it was all there in him. I just had to know what I wanted in him. And he would give everything that I needed to me. Um, but yeah, Philip and I, we're still good friends now. Um, I think we did really form um, a nice bond on set and really wanted to make sure that people were invested in us as a couple. And Totally. And like one of the big things I've heard from both the cast or the crew I've gotten a chance to talk with about Origins is that despite a short shoot, like everyone really coalesced and became a family, like things became yeah. very close on set. What do you think kind of brought around, uh, brought about that kind of specific camaraderie uh, in this particular shoot um, for Stargate Origins? I think everyone really wanted it to be good and everyone really cared about making something because we knew how much people cared about this story Certainly. about Stargate and there's already so much history and there's already a world that's been created. And we had, we knew that we had to perform. We knew that we had to deliver something that people would be, I mean, somewhat happy with, or we were giving something to people that meant a lot to them. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of, um, what's the word? There's a, not pressure. It's not pressure, but like a respect for what you're working on. Um, and a respect for the people that you're working with and, it's not easy being on a film set. Um, it's very hard work and everyone's really putting in the hours and it's, it's long, hard days and hot usually. And it was really hot when we were filming. So I heard the desert was like 110 degrees or something when you were shooting there, like ridiculous temperatures. Uh, I think, I don't know. I don't know. I, okay. That was, yeah, that was hot. <laughs> um, I think it was, I'm not sure if it was like 90. It, it, it definitely hit a hundred. Okay. It definitely hit 100. Yeah. Anytime you break triple digits, I mean, that's tough to be out in the sun that yeah. much, especially like, yep. you know, you don't have umbrellas during all the takes. So like you're getting really like pelted by the sun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've actually, I've been um, cutting together some scenes um, from Stargate. So I've been watching that desert, the desert scenes a lot. And I, I'm just like, wow, you are holding it together so well, Ellie. That was... <laughs> That was tough. Right. And some of the most classic Stargate scenes, I feel like, came from 
the stuff that you shot in the desert, like specifically yeah. one scene with you and I'm just gonna say Kasuf because I can't do the cool mm. accent that Daniel Hasif. Rashid does it. Hasif, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the hard K. Yeah, there's like a great scene where you kind of pull him aside and and you get kind of like into a deeper dialogue with him about oh, yes about uh, the fact that he is essentially a slave but doesn't yes. realize he's being abused because he thinks the gods are just like infallible like that was that mm-hmm. was a really cool scene how was it to play that kind of it gets deep you know because there's plenty of real world parallels with that yes a fun fact about that scene um they wrote that they added that in pretty much a day and a half before when we were on our way out to the desert um oh really <laughs> yeah and then they gave me well me and daniel they gave us the egyptian to learn <laughs> the night before so last minute and then we had the big desert shoot day which was one of the most exhausting days of my year for sure um and then we had to get up and do the that um so that was that was a hard scene for me to do because that language for me just did not come organically but it was a really important scene and I'm really glad that they added it in because it it, it was really important to question what was going on and what I had seen and that it didn't seem right to me. And yeah, it is a really important moment for Catherine to have with Kasuf or otherwise it just almost seems like they don't really care. Well, it's because they don't, I think they don't even realize they're being, they don't see anything wrong. So they don't no. see a reason to care. And like, when you have that kind of brainwashing, it's like, you know, your character, you might very much care that this is happening, but there's no way to get the, get them to realize that you can't pull yeah. the scales from their eyes. It's just that is their world, yeah. And they're not gonna. Someone who just showed up yesterday, they're not gonna say, "Oh yeah, you're right. I've been wrong for 20 years." It's like a hard yes. realization for a character to come to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it really, really is. So apart from the desert scenes, which seemed quite rigorous and spontaneous, and and, and pretty crazy to shoot and what were your other favorite parts of shooting the show like a memory or a scene that you'll take away that like is really a golden nugget from the experience shooting stargate origins um i really loved shooting i loved being in the warehouse i loved that that location that space it just had that in itself felt like a, a character in the film and there was so much richness in there that was just already there yeah, it wasn't even absolutely. part of the set dressing or anything it was just really cool to be there where did you guys um, find that warehouse was that just in la um, yeah it's in la in downtown la oh wow. yeah that's super yeah it looks like you said it looks so rich it's like it's almost like it was designed because it has so much old character to it yeah yeah and it, i think most of it was just like that i mean apart from putting up the stargate and adding specific time um appropriate props there wasn't really yeah there wasn't that much to it so outside of production you know you you had the set experience and and now both origins is out in both the web format and the feature format how has it been to join like a venerable sci-fi franchise and and go to the conventions maybe get recognized a bit more how has like your life changed or your career changed in in a post stargate experience um, probably not as much as people might think. Okay. Um, I went to Comic-Con whilst we were still filming. I haven't gone to any other conventions yet. Um, I'm thinking I might go to the one in Vancouver. And that's something where it's like, it's crazy. Even the supporting characters from mm-hmm. like older shows, not even the regular cast members, 10 years later, they're still going to conventions because the fandom uh-huh. is so kind of cherishes these characters so much. Yeah. 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 It's a, it's a very, very loyal, um, fan base, but, um, yeah, I haven't really gone to many. There's one coming up in San Diego actually soon, isn't there? The biggest one, Comic-Con. Comic-Con. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Are yeah. you going to that one or as a I'm not sure yet. So I should think about that again. Maybe maybe we will. I think it's this month though, isn't it? July, which is July. crazy. It's crazy because it, not even a year ago was when they announced Stargate Origins. And now we've already, you know, the feature cut's already out and like you have to look ahead to the future of Stargate. So like it's mm-hmm. a pretty fast timetable. How is it actually getting to shoot? Did you guys have a lot of time to do it? Or I heard it was kind of a 
pretty brisk shoot so like you had to rehearse extensively going in um, um or is that we well they had longer rehearsals than i was a part of because we had five weeks of shooting and they had maybe a week and a half of rehearsals but i only got to come on at the end because i was cast so late in the process <laughs> but um it was pretty quick it, it was it was a quick shoot, but um, we had enough time to do everything. I think, I mean, you never have as much time as you probably want to make things unless you've got a giant budget or you're doing a big feature or even network stuff gets done really quickly. And that's just where your prep has to come in. You have to be ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so at the beginning of the story, I was just thinking of the character. She's been with her father forever. I mean, that's kind of like, kind of like what we were talking about earlier, how she's in a different cultural place because she spent so much time with her father. Do you think at, at all, like, she maybe wishes she had more of a traditional upbringing? Or was was your interpretation of Catherine Lang for, like, this is what she was born to do? Um, I don't think she wishes. I think she would have thought about it. Right. I think she would have fantasized about it. Um, and I think that's kind of where the romance with Beale comes from. Yeah, um, absolutely. That that intrigue of, you know, living a normal life or getting to grow up around boys and go to school. But I, I don't think – I think that she feels lucky that she's been able to grow up in an environment like that and not be a – not a victim uh, of her generation but a victim of her time and for women of her time that she didn't – have to go off and, you know, just kind of be a trained homemaker. Right. And the, the cosmic significance of what she's working on is, is pretty apparent too, yep. you know, as she goes on. So she, there's that kind of extra um, significance to the fact that she does live an extraordinary life. Yeah. She doesn't have the exposure though to that we do now. The under, Like there's no, I think people back then were a lot more present in their environment because you weren't, there wasn't as many distractions or there wasn't, it, you didn't know what was going on in other places like we do now. You don't know what the world looks like outside of the world that you're in as much. You right. just have not ideas or you get information and it's really slow. So yeah, there is, you just, you would be so much more present and involved in the place that you're in. And in terms of her character and kind of like how she chooses how to act in these positions, um, her, her father being kidnapped is kind of the MacGuffin in a sense. It's what gets the story started and what gets her involved yes. in, to, you know, gets her to step through the Stargate. Yeah. About halfway through, she starts to realize it's a bit bigger than her father. Uh, when she realizes that she's uh, well accustomed with now the culture of Stargate and then the power of the Stargate. So mm -hmm. she realizes she also has to stop the Nazis and has to stop a breach how do you think she balances that? If, the, if she was put in a situation where it was one or the other, like I get to rescue my father or mm -hmm. or potentially open up a, a portal to another world for evil oh, yeah. forces, how would she make an emotional decision? Would she have to like stick Ooh. with the rational? How would that work? What, what do you mean? Like would she sacrifice her father for – or? Or like choose one or the other, like her father or the world? Is kind that... of. Like in this story, you know, in this specific, oh. in this moment of her life. Would she, would she, would logic overtake her and say, I have to sacrifice for the greater good? Or is it like, no, I think that she would choose logic. I, really? I don't, I don't, I mean, it would break. She'd break. That would be the worst thing that could ever happen to her. But I think she, she cares about things more deeply to decide that, you know, having a dad around and potentially ruining the world or, yeah, she she is a big picture person. I it, when she gives herself the time to think about things, and she's kind of the voice of reason, which is cool. Um, yeah, she, the story. yeah. Even if she's brave, she's making the decisions because there's kind of like an, a, a righteousness to her thought process, where she's like, "This has to happen," you know. Yes, yeah. They're really she. Yeah, she's very righteous. So, do you find yourself? You do find yourself very similar to Catherine. Would you say is that a character? I mean, there's definitely elements of her in me and, you know, with all the characters that I get to play, I have to find a way to make them my own or how I can use parts of myself to bring them to life. But um, 
there are a lot of differences. I mean, she's very intellectual and, you know, an academic essentially. And I'm, that's no, that's not me. (laughs) Uh, But she is very headstrong and stands up for herself and um, can assert herself. And I think that I am, I think Catherine probably helped me to be more like that in my life and um, in my work. So it was it was really fun to get to play someone like that because she is like me a little bit, but I think she's further from who I am as Ellie. That well, that makes sense. Her tenacity, I think, was was the highlight of of the story and what kind of brought that spirit that we know maybe from the feature film because she is decades later, albeit, but she is the matriarch of the Stargate program and she is kind of what sets the world we know, the universe we know of the TV shows into action. Well, I'm so glad that I got to be a part of it and yeah, that I hope that girls watch that and women watch that and think that, you know, I can, I should assert myself around certain people or I can go after what I want or I should stand up for myself or the things that I believe in and yeah, they're her core that, you asked me before what her core values are. They're her core <laughs> values, and I hope people see that, and I hope that they maybe take it into their own lives or are inspired to live more of that path. And now that now that the feature cut is out, it's a great time to go back and relive that yeah, adventure again. It's Watch on it again. iTunes, all the digital uh, platforms. It's pretty big because now it's not just new Stargate. It's like a new Stargate movie. Like We can put yeah. it in the catalog with the other films. So for you, Ellie Gall, what is next in your career? Do you have any exciting projects coming up? You can tease any kind of direction looking to do more film or TV. I'm actually looking to do more theater. Um, hopefully working on developing my own projects now. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very drawn to having a more enriching acting experience at the moment and really working on my technique and, um, finding some good writing, maybe even try some writing myself, Um, just doing things that I haven't tried before. Obviously working on a film set or whatever set would be lovely, but um, yeah, just kind of self-directing at the moment, taking it into my own hands, maybe like Catherine would. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's so great to have had you um, and and get sit down and talk about Origins. We look forward to following your career in the future and hopefully getting to see you around at a few fan conventions over the years now that that you're part of the family. Yeah, definitely. You'll definitely see me soon. I'll be around.